Okay, good evening. Thanks, Bradley. And congratulations. We're on 50 years in. That's quite an achievement. Um, so, naval architecture, marine engineering, and law as well, right? So, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, when Bradley asked me to um, speak about it, he noted that we'd recently opened an office in Fort Lauderdale, and he said, yachts, you do yachts? I said, well, yeah, we have a team that does yachts, and, yeah, can you come speak about it at the March meeting? So, yeah, absolutely no problem at all. What, what's going to be of interest? And it, once I started looking into this, I realized that since I last did a, a large yacht build 10 years ago before I moved to New York, there's been a few changes uh, in the within the regulatory bodies and industries of how we go about planning, regulating these these large builds. And that's really the subject of the talk tonight, is regulations that really came in 1st of January, and I hadn't seen too much about them in the general press at the time, or industry press, I'm not expecting that to be in the uh, New York Daily Post, but that hadn't really been reflected through. Maybe if you're involved directly with super yacht building and planning, you would have been very aware of this already, but the wider community didn't really have, seem to have much understanding of it. So I don't know, just generally within the room, I know we have a lot of students. Do we have anyone who's directly involved with sort of super yacht planning or, or building? Okay. Def definitely a couple of people. So if I need some assistance, we'll get those guys... Um, those guys input as well so where are we here Brent we can click just click through right okay well, that, that's one of my babies in the in the picture there and um, so, some of this was a that was a, a fairly big refit job putting a helicopter pad on top of the bridge um, with various regulatory implications in in terms of fall off angles for aircraft and that got quite interesting, but I'm not going to get into that one in detail. You can ask me about it later and buy me a beer. Um, that's just our general disclaimer. So don't design a boat based on what I'm going to tell you. Um, I've had some input from our naval architect in the office as well on this. And uh, this is more of a general, general educational presentation to make people aware of the new regulations and how they may be implemented if you guys do get involved in managing, in refitting, or building um, large yachts. So generally, um, when I'm talking super yachts, I'm talking generally stuff that's probably 50 meters or above, but for the regulatory purposes, it would be probably 24 meters and over, length overall, so nearly 100 feet long and more. So I'm, I'm not talking about recreational um, craft uh, that, are, that are operated generally by the buyer or the owner themselves. This is uh, more the lar larger end of the, of the market. So we get into a bit of, of the, the build market and you know why, why it's important for you guys as, as people coming into the industry and um, also people who already work at technical consulting firms. It's a fairly large and vibrant market. So just explain a bit about where that market's located. Um, doesn't really get much general press uh, flag state considerations in, in terms of where these vessels are flagged and why the codes that I'll talk about are important internationally and not just for the flag states that, um, that aren't necessarily in the US. Um, size matters, um, certainly with regulatory uh, parts on this. So this the, the amount of persons on board, the tonnage, the, the length overall is a major factor within the uh, super yacht industry, whereas generally uh, cargo ships might more go on the gross tonnage or uh, towing vessels on gross tonnage, um, yachts tend to look at length overall. Uh, some about the current regulatory matrix, so I'm not going to get too much into classification societies, um, there's not really anything on class rules in this. The majority of the IAX class societies will have yacht specific regulations, which um, will be referenced when doing a build, of course, and a lot of the regulations we'll talk about refer back to recognized organizations, which will be IAX class. Um, some, some on the, uh, the newly introduced regulations, which is kind of the core content of this presentation and why it's um, relevant in uh, March 2019 effect on existing vessels. We're not just talking about new build for these regulations. Uh, any managers or uh, technical superintendents, port engineers of large yachts should be aware uh, in terms of crew manning. We'll get into a bit of that. 
new bill considerations, uh, some on that and, and how these regulations can affect that. Um, and I feel for a few slides in, Bradley mentioned that some of the web students were doing uh, projects on, uh, was it zero emissions or green carbon emission sort of super yachts. Uh, one of my naval architects did a SNAMI presentation for the Gulf Coast New Orleans chapter recently and I borrowed a couple of his slides and um, if anyone wants that presentation I'll be happy to send that over to them as well so I just put a couple of things in there that may be considered in future trends. That's just a bit about us I think Bradley already mentioned that we cover offshore energy as well but that's on our marine side is um, ports terminals, um, surveys, consultancy and uh, over on the right uh, super yacht services so project management and uh, generally surveys of, of vessels and planning specification reviews uh, for, for new builds. So where are we at the moment? Um, these are some of the numbers at the moment. These are, these are probably vessels over the 30 meter mark. So over 5,000 worldwide. That's a significant number, not compared to commercial ships, but majority motor yachts. It's a massively growing industry, despite the, um, the economic downturn in 2008, 2009. It took a little bit of a dip then and um, has continued to pick up pace ever since with new interest from the Asia-Pac region, uh, owners in different locations, not generally the traditional super yacht owners, and there's high demand for these vessels and for the engineering around them. The average length overall, 52 meters, and 10 years ago, 44 meters was probably the uh, 99 or 100th biggest in the world and now you've got to be around that 90 meter mark uh, length overall again size matters but they're, they're getting bigger they're getting more complex and more subject to uh, to the rules that um, affect more passenger vessels that's last year i think nearly 150 new yachts and under construction as well. Build yards are very busy with these. Not necessarily in the US. There's a few yards building yacht, large yachts in the US, not as many as they used to be, but um, certainly in other regions around the world, are, are, there are a lot of a lot of yards building available for sale. So a lot of built on spec um, or owners undertake the build just to sell them on. And I think that's uh, one of the bits that's probably interesting to us guys over here in the US is still one fifth of the market is US um, high net worth individuals looking at these vessels for purchase. And just uh, a brief overview on the countries there. So Italy has a lot of the um, high volume manufacturer large yachts. So that, that's why they're really number one there. They do have some big yards. Fincantieri build them. Um, but people like Benetti, uh, CRN, there's quite a few brands over there building yachts which meet the, uh, the super yacht size, I guess, definition which would fall into this. And aside from that, the ne Netherlands and Germany are really um, pushing the boundaries on the size, size of the, the large, real high end, the Rolls Royce of the yachts. And Tur Turkey's really picked up as well with quite a few things like exploration vessels and um, trying to offer a competitive product in the market. See, the U US does have some, certainly some in there where that would be um, yards on the Gulf Coast, uh, Westport and uh, Delta out in the Seattle region, uh, plus some others that are sneaking into that uh, 30 meter range with things like large sport fishers as well. Okay, so with that in mind, there's obviously a lot of vessels being built, um, how do the owners go about choosing which flag state? Now, you might think, okay, that's going to be with the um, nationality of the owner. Hey, I'm American, I want an American-built, American flag vessel. Well, it doesn't end up being that simple. So, generally the first guy they're going to talk to is the lawyer. Um, so, Will is taking notes, so we, we can always ask uh, her some questions on that. And um, but tax and commercial implications of where you're going to flag the vessel are, are going to be very important to this. Ease of registry. How easy is it to get that, that new build or that um, conversion put over into that, into that register of shipping in that country? 
regulatory, regulatory support, uh, I'll talk more about that when we get into the codes. Um, has that country, if you're building a yacht, do they have really good technical people there who can listen to a naval architect on behalf of the owner? The owner says, hey, I want this crazy uh, addition to my boat. It doesn't quite fit within your rules. You do need good technical people on the other side to bounce things off and um, show them that you're going to meet at least that safety standard, that engineering standard that they intended within their, within their code. Internationally accepted um, white list is the, like the IMO list of flag states there where the black list would be vessels that are getting detained a lot. Grey list is somewhere in the middle. I think as a super yacht owner, you want to be able to cruise the world, pull into a port, not have flag state inspectors crawling all over your beautiful yacht looking for defects or um, safety deficiencies. So that that kind of white list, that, that flag state that's well regarded within industry is key. Charter considerations, uh, more on the commercial side to reduce the cost of a yacht uh, operation. A lot of owners will either full-time charter the yacht and just use it a couple of weeks a year for them and their family. It may be a, a commercial charter operation or they may just want to defer some of the cost with a, the occasional charter. So some flag states allow that, make it easy within the rules, some don't. Um, and as I briefly mentioned earlier, it's not always based on the yacht owner's nationality. There's a lot of super yacht owners out there are US citizens and very, very few US flagged super yachts. I don't have a number, but uh, there's certainly not that many vessels o over um, three, 400 tons that are US flagged. I'm a Brit, so I've got to put this in there, but the, um, the UK led the way back, back in about um, 1997. The, uh, the large yacht code was introduced in the UK. They were trying to find ways of improving the, the registry of yachts, getting some money in. Uh, with the departure of commercial vessels to foreign flag fleets as, as well as seeing this was an opportunity to to really get stuck in and, and develop a code. Most of the codes for large vessels were very much commercial based so you're trying to adapt a container ship, um, a code developed for a container ship or a tanker to a luxury yacht, it wasn't really working so they brought in the yacht, large yacht code for yachts over 24 meters, uh, this is for commercial yachts and that, that was in response to this growing demand. So why don't we see that? Why is it UK or the majority in this photo at least, um, all these what we call red ensigns? Um, I asked some of my colleagues in the office earlier when I was giving a quick draft of this presentation to them, and they all said, well, what's the red ensign? I said, I just assumed that they knew, but that's uh, the UK Merchant Marine or Merchant Navy flag. So the the UK flag in the corner and then the red the red duster or the red ensign. So what I'll be talking about a fair amount in this is red ensign group or red ensign group countries. So Cayman Islands, Bermuda, the UK, the Isle of Man, Gibraltar are all in this um, kind of red ensign group. They're all individual sovereign nations but adopt the um, have adopted the same codes under the red ensign. The US doesn't have so much uh, of this so Prior to this year, and randomly, in the, I found this in the National Defense Authorization Act, which is exactly where you'd expect to find a yacht uh, code, is, uh, this is the, uh, just signed into law in August last year, 2018, uh, way down in that document is the Large Recreational Vessel Regulation. And this piece of uh, legislation in the US should allow yachts that are US flagged to be over 300 gross tons. Now, before this was signed into law, anything over 300 tons would be required to have commercial vessel inspections, commercial vessel crewing, and all of the good stuff that goes along with that, which didn't really work too well for super yacht um, operators or owners. So, it was um, also meant you know, you've got to have uh, US crew on board and um, operate that probably almost like a Jones Act vessel. So the new act, um, because this, this was a random passage in this uh, large congressional document, 
the Coast Guard doesn't appear to have been, have been given any funding or uh, much heads up about this <coughs> happening. So at the moment, there is no, as far as I'm aware, no US Coast Guard legislation or uh, CFRs that cover large commercial yachts. So very graciously, the US has currently agreed to adopt the United Kingdom's codes in this, uh, in this respect, which uh, I don't know how often that happens, but it's all a bit of a loving right now. Um, there are some um, implications that I'm not quite sure how this will pan out with the lawyers, but it does state in there that they can't carry any cargo or passengers if they're flagged in the US. So as I previously mentioned, try, trying to flag a yacht and then defer some of the costs with charter agreements or having charter guests on board, I don't quite know how that will, um, will work out because, again, this is very new legislation. There's probably a bunch of lawyers talking about this and how it will work. Uh, the beneficial owner currently has to be identified and a lot of large yacht owners want to do this through an LLC or some um, shell company. They don't particularly want to have that asset attached to them for various reasons. Um, I could see that as being a potential drawback. And um, currently the officers and the essential crew, which would be the operating crew of the vessel, have to be US citizens and US certified, which doesn't apply to a lot of the ex supernumerary crew on board a yacht, which would be the masseuse, the hairdresser, the maybe the owner's chef flying around with them, but certainly the core operating crew, the deck hands, the um, the officers on the bridge, the engine room have to be uh, have to be US, which is not that easy to do sometimes in in terms of getting crew who are experienced in uh, in these types of vessels, and uh, also then it adds additional cost and complexity in terms of Jones Act claims and uh, hiring. And the uh, Congress has promised that the Coast Guard will have a US flag specific code which will broadly be based on the uh, United Kingdom or, um, or the Red Ensign Group Large Yacht Code 3 or which is now the, the Red Ensign Group Yacht Code by around 2020. Um, we're now in 2019, I'm not sure how far along that is but we will see with, uh, they don't have much funding apparently for it. So. But it is something positive to tweet about, as uh, Mr. Trump says there. But um, you probably note that the Trump princess was actually registered in Nassau in the uh, Bahamas. So it's, uh, that was a few years ago, judging by the hair. <laughs> I'm not sure which wife that is. I know the boat, I don't know the wives. Um, Okay, so regardless really of the, um, of the code that the vessel is, is under during build or, or put under maybe during a transfer of ownership or flag, um, there's still obviously the, the main international marine regulations which I would think most people in this room are fully familiar with and, and those don't change for, for any of this. So MARPOL, Colregs and SOLAS, except SOLAS does have that exemption in there for pleasure yachts not engaged in trade. So generally, I'm going to be focusing more on yachts that are built for potential charter. Um, there's not much point to me if I was advising a client. I wouldn't advise them really to build a yacht that wasn't built to a, a code where they could commercially charter the vessel. The resale value will be a lot lower, and potentially if things don't work out and they do want to charter it, then they're going to be uh, in, in difficulty doing that. And uh, the International Convention on Load Lines as well would normally apply. So, so currently, or until the uh, end of 2018, we had the, um, again, this is under the Red Ensign kind of group, which is the majority of super yachts, I'd say, out there. Or well, people have adopted this code and other flag registries outside the Red Ensign countries have, have said, okay, that, that code is fine and we, we'll agree with it. Um, we had what was called the Passenger Yacht Code, or PYC, and that was for 13 to 36 passengers and up to about 200 persons on board. That's now been morphed into the Red Ensign Group, or REG there, um, code which is split into a Part A and a Part B. I'm not quite sure why I put that bullet point first, but 
Then you have the, uh, the commercial yachts there. If you're only carrying up to 12 passengers, which is uh, a lot of these yachts were built up to 12 passengers because then you could get away with having cargo ship regulations, which was kind of the standard before we had something else to go on. And that's basically cargo ship SOLAS codes and everything else. And uh, that's now forming part A of this um, Red Ensign Group code. So the, the new regulation is basically the, the PYC and the LY3 code put into one document or a part A and a part B of, of the reg yacht code. But during that time as well, it's had various updates and changes. Um, this, the large yacht code, which is now until the end of 2018, LY3, has had three iterations. That's why it's number three now. And the uh, passenger yacht code has been in existence probably for coming up 10 years now, maybe eight, eight or nine years. Uh, guys, guys who recently done yachts, so uh, I guess passenger yacht code's been around that time. So. So I, I put a few of these slides here. I'm not going to go through them in detail because there's, and uh, I have one of my naval architects help me out with this. Some, some of it's, um, this was just really comparing the different standards that might apply or trying, trying to put it at least on one slide. So it's not perfect, but basically looking at, this is yachts, uh, commercial yachts up to the 12 passengers, which would be LY3 or now part A of the, uh, reg yacht code so when we're looking at damage stability for those smaller yachts under uh, under 500 gross tons we're looking at minor pinhole damages for the uh, damage stability assessments over that over 85 meters as well uh, one compartment damage we'll get into like lifeboats if you've got two compartment damage stability then there's exemptions available for the amount if you have to have lifeboats or not uh, we're not I think we're getting into that probabilistic assessment and um, of damage stability, which we're now using on some cargo ship side of things. And with, with that mix of life rafts, uh, marine evacuation systems, the generally the, the flag states operating under the reg code are, are quite open to suggestions, reasonable suggestions, as long as we're not trying to bend the rules, as long as it's a, an equivalency, then I think that's one of the main things of what I'll go through here is really as naval architects, as engineers, we have a very good um, chance, certainly with the yacht codes, more perhaps than the commercial shipping codes or regulatory bodies of number one, having resource through owners who want something really special to, to propose and engineer stuff that's outside of the norm. So it's quite an exciting industry or something like that to, for, I'd imagine for designers, naval architects to uh, to come up with solutions and, and workarounds of what might seem like a black and white law. That was just a sort of another way of showing that um, kind of by, by length as well. It's uh, kind of an approximation here, but if, if we're getting the bottom left there in the gray is the uh, up to 12 passengers and um, as, as we're getting bigger, the smaller size, but not needing, needing light. Uh, lifeboats on board under 85 meters at the bottom. Again, it's all, it all seems to come into the length uh, issue here, and then compared to the uh, commercial ships on the right-hand side of the screen. Then one, once you get into the 36 passenger side, this is this um, passenger yacht code, then we're starting to see that drift across from uh, commercial passenger ships in terms of lifeboats, life rafts, those that usage come in come into the um, commercial yacht side as well and be able to be used there um, so when I was doing the build of this vessel and we, we ended up say some of the workarounds of problems was at that time we were building this as a full um, commercial passenger vessel rule. Um, this was before PYC was really um, invoked. And we had to come up with these uh, custom tender stroke lifeboats. The owner did not want the regular lifeboat that you can buy from um, Shat Harding or one, one, of the, uh, one of the manufacturers. So we came up with a custom designed lifeboat. But again, the work around the discussion with Flagstate, for instance, was 
Okay, if you want that, this still has to meet all the requirements of a SOLAS approved LSA um, regulations lifeboat. So that meant building two of these lifeboats for the ship, but also building ones that we could destructively test, do the capsize testing on, and also make it a luxury uh, interior inside that so we could use it as a tender. So trying to get all that together and, and stay within the LSA codes under SOLAS, but also develop God knows how many presentations we went through of what color that roof would be at the time, but it was, uh, we didn't want it orange, but it could be yellow, but not that kind of yellow. So we ended up coming to an agreement with the flag state that was a Bermuda on that ship, and uh, it, it worked out. Um, can't quite see it in that picture, but there's a little um, side boarding door just below it, which created all sorts of headaches as well, because the naval architect put a boarding door there, but with the, uh, the launching of the lifeboat, we couldn't have any interference then of the launching with the with the vessel heeled over so we had to have all sorts of then documents in place that it had to be locked at sea there couldn't be any way to um, open this boarding door there otherwise it would we wouldn't be able to launch our lifeboat okay so damage stability i touched upon a little bit there so this is uh, up to 12 passengers so you can go a bit bigger there still with your one compartment damage and under the 85 meters, under 12 people, then we're, we're still looking at this pinhole damage, which I'm not sure if I'd want to uh, go transatlantic on something with pinhole damage stability, but the uh, naval architects probably work out how quickly it floods and how quickly we can bail it out. But um, And then again, on, on the right-hand side, we're, we're still looking at commercial shipping rules in that that are more based now on probabilistic assessments of damage stability than the, uh, the old-school deterministic models. Uh, so just to explain, if I'm, you know, as naval architects, if you've got the pinhole damage, you're, you're looking at one small egress, just to give an example, and um, one compartment, you, you've got that set prescribed length penetration coming into the, to one compartment, or the, or the same one obviously hits the bulkhead and you've got suddenly got two compartments flooded. So. Hopefully that doesn't happen. We've lost the engine room and the uh, and the steering gear and the stores as well. Okay, so it's also affecting the, the codes are looking at um, things like fire protection, egress routes, um, shell door opening. There's a the whole documents are available online. There's um, probably four or five hundred pages of, of these codes out there. Um, but gen generally on yachts, we're we're looking at. Things like fire loadings where interior furnishings are not going to be the same as you would see on a commercial ship. So fire loads are necessarily somewhat higher than might normally be accepted um, under a commercial ship rule. So there are various adjustments in place to that. And um, see on the left there, we've got no, no restriction, restrictions on combustible material in interior outfitting within reason. I'm, I'm not saying we're going to put uh, something there that's going to catch fire by itself, but there are certainly a lot more, there's a lot more room for manoeuvre there. Um, owners want certain types of carpets, tapestries, furniture in there. Um, you don't want to be restricted too much by, by the commercial ship rules. And um, as well as that, when you get smaller as well, uh, a, only A30 ratings versus A60 on, on larger ships for uh, for category one spaces like machinery spaces and um, switchboard transformer rooms and I've got up there as well of course on a yacht you're going to have a sauna so you've got a that has its own its own rules which you generally wouldn't find maybe on a uh, on a commercial ship ruling. So that that's just a comparison there again of. Um, of some of the, the sizes and uh, again up to the 12 passengers or what would be a cargo ship uh, cargo ship rule and again there's the uh, restrictions on combustible material got to be within reason still but that would be on, on the bottom right there what we would be allowed to have on a uh, on a passenger ship for instance and most people are probably aware there just just to give an illustration that's what I'm talking about with a60 a30s and the, um, the point loading is the 180 degrees at a single point or a seam 
and then the temperature rise. This is Celsius, sorry, um, I'm still working in metric 10 years later, but we're, um, we're looking at that, that fire coming through the bulkhead there. Okay, so um, the red yacht code. So th this is the Red Ensign Group yacht code, which is probably going to be the, the preeminent document in terms of planning and um, designing vessels for the coming few years at least um, until maybe the US flag gets gets going on this um, and it was just just introduced uh, January 1 2019 as a part A and a part B uh, both these documents um, they're actually not a bad read I, I think they're, they're well laid out um, it's no John Grisham novel but it's um, quite a quite an easily read document for, for designers. It's laid out to make it easy to find items of interest when you're, when you're designing or looking at modifications on a vessel. And that uh, that website is there, the uh, redensongroup.org. The publications and the appendices are all freely downloadable there. And I'd suggest certainly for the students, download them, take a look through them if you're not aware of them already. and. Uh, they're a great reference source and uh, also a good document, I think, to see how things evolve over the years and how, how various, um, say, special interests like a yacht would be taken into account in, regulation, in regulations. That's just a bit of background there. Um, a gentleman from the Cayman Islands uh, Registry was very, he gave a good presentation on this from their point of view. And I've borrowed some of his um, bullet points to assist me rather than piling through 400 pages of legislation, but this, that's the the overview here. Is the um, there are the part A for the smaller, or not necessarily smaller vessels, but carrying less people. Part B for the over 36 passengers, up to 200 persons total. So that that should cover the majority of super yachts in the foreseeable future. And if they're getting bigger than that, then we really should be moving towards a, um, a cruise ship classification of, or regulation, in my opinion anyway, as they are getting a lot bigger now. Um, there's uh, common annexes which really detail out all of the, the various things, uh, battery systems, electrical systems, fire, and a lot of that is common or it will certainly determine whether it's applicable to the Part A or Part B. Uh, the way that SOLAS works with the amendments and the revisions to it, it used to be that the uh, large yacht code was not fully in sync with SOLAS, so SOLAS would be talking about a new release of documentation and then other regulatory bodies would follow afterwards. So the new code has brought the whole legislative process in line with SOLAS, so if SOLAS is going to publish something, it should also hit the, uh, the new yacht code at the same time. Uh, should be common sense, but I guess governments don't work that way. And 2020 SOLAS will, will come out in the uh, next revision of the Yacht Code, apparently. And I already mentioned there that all this uh, documentation should be available at the Red Ensign Group website. There's a list of the, the new annexes that have been put here. So all the documentation is in one place. Um, I used to find it as a project manager a royal pain trying to go back through various regulations and backwards and forwards between class documents, SOLAS, LSA, uh, the flag state rules, talking to the flag state surveyor. And there was documentation all over the place for that. But this really does bring it all together in these annexes. And um, they're, they're really quite useful. Now, the a lot of this is going to apply to new builds, but and not be retroactive to existing vessels but certainly on the um, sort of halfway down there or passengers and occasional workers now commercial ships you don't get many occasional workers but in the yacht industry you get a lot of uh, day workers who are going to walk the dock want to come on do some cleaning do some uh, shipping or whatever they want whatever they're going to do down in the engine room or on, on deck helping out they're not full-time crew members they're not necessarily signed on to the uh, ship's articles so th this gives some guidance and um, useful tips there, certainly for the crew and the operations, the managers of, of these vessels. 
um, the Manning, the STCW requirements, the um, ILO hours of work regulations, requirements for how the crew are accommodated on board. A lot of that is going to be applicable to existing vessels. So I'm hoping that most yacht management companies and um, have already looked at this and adopted it anyway, but, but it's all in there. Okay, so I won't go through all of that, but certainly compared to um, compared to a lot of commercial vessels, you're not normally going to see helicopter um, issues in commercial vessels. Maybe on the offshore vessels, you'll have a an offshore like a Cap 437 or something like that code, but generally commercial vessels it is um, not quite as explicit regarding things like helicopters. Okay, so some of the changes since the uh, LY3, and this is, it incorporates all the changes since the first um, yacht code. So it's not, you don't have to keep looking back at the 1997 version. It should all be, it should all be in there. And I'm taking that as uh, from one of the flag state um, employees who told me that and gave me some of this information. So I really hope that's true because I did not comb through each document and. Uh, check it side by side, but um, that, is the, that is the intention. Now, there are also, as things have moved on, um, some of these new annexes now really give more specifics, and um, the one that was interesting to me was things like oversight working systems. If anyone's been up in Newport, Rhode Island, or down in Fort Lauderdale where there's a lot of super yachts, you're, you're going to see crew members dangling precariously over the side of the ship, hanging onto a Genoa track or a sail car track, and there have been a lot of accidents with these. They weren't a lot of yachts. They put them in for convenience, but they weren't properly load tested. They were not specifically designed for that. That kind of thing is retroactive now. So if these systems are on yachts that exist now, they need to be upgraded. They need to be load tested. They need to be inspected. And for, for good reason, because a lot of them, somebody just put some self-tapping screws into the aluminum or the GRP uh, superstructure. And when they pull out, and the guy drops 20 meters, then it, it's not a good plan. Um, drills and exercises, a lot, there's a lot of emphasis on bringing up the standards of yacht crews to um, commercial awareness in terms of uh, drilling for emergencies, for fire, flooding, collisions, medical emergencies. So that, that is all within this. Um, I think I already mentioned, so new vessels constructed after January 1, I assume they mean keel laying, not delivery there, because we're already going to be a long way down the design process by the time we are um, out here. Bearing in mind, the average build on a large yacht is probably three to, five, three to five years, and we're not going to be switching out yachts that are nearly due for delivery at this point. So is it, is it, is it, the existing vessels, is, there's a lot of good content here which could be put into refits, um, owners or operators looking to upgrade the vessels to the new standards, I think that would be useful. Um, again, not everything, a lot of it's going to be too much, uh, too much for that particular vessel design to, to chop and change it, but certainly a lot of, lot of good information there. And I already mentioned there, things like crew training, hours of work, certification, STCW requirements are rolling in there. I'll just, that's just an excerpt from one of the appendices really giving, uh, there's a few pages on these uh, oversight working systems and giving a lot of information on how often they have to be tested, what standards they have to be tested to. And again, that's being adopted across the industry, um, including, I guess, by that act of Congress under the, uh, under the US, although I'm not sure that Coast Guard inspectors would necessarily, at the moment, be looking at this. So this is a, it's a, um, there's a lot of talk in the passenger ship industry and um, upcoming regulation on safe return to port and um, emergency hotel systems more than the required SOLAS emergency generator supplies or battery supplies and that's making its way across into the yacht market. That is currently ongoing. Uh, it's not in force yet, but I expect it will be. So when we're looking at new yacht designs, new, um, Again, talking about the big yachts, we're over 120 people here, and, and in, 
international voyages. So that that's going to be key because there's a lot of design issues that come in with uh, safe return to port systems. It's not as easy as um, saying, okay, let's stamp that with a good to go. Um, we're going to be moving more into the uh, failure mode effect analysis kind of things that we would see in the offshore industry uh, with DP2, DP3 vessels. Um, not necessarily that the yachts will be DP, but that, that kind of planning, if we lose that switchboard, what have we still got? If we lose that propulsion, what have we still got? Um, and that, that meeting is meant to be taking place um, soon. The TF Technical Forum is, is meeting right around now, and uh, according to Cayman Islands, that, that is all up for discussion and potential implementation in the 2020 version. So I mentioned it briefly, that's really what we're um, looking at, essential systems here and um, the safe return to port redundancy for these various systems, which, yeah, a lot of them are already covered under SOLAS, but heating and ventilation, sanitation and food and water, not necessarily so. So th these are things that, from the design aspect we're going to have to uh, look at including. And yeah, sorry, I have a whole slide on that. There we go. So um, potentially separate engine and steering gear rooms, shaft lines. A lot of yachts are now going to ASI pods and diesel electric, so that might help out with that anyway. Uh, something to bear in mind on the design front. Potentially separating these engine rooms with the A60 bulkheads on that size of ship, it would be, um, and that, those amount of people, we would be talking A60 uh, boundaries. Hotel services, again, this is basically a small cruise ship or a large cruise ship, and um, there we go. So, okay. So, And again, that last point there is almost akin to what you would see in the offshore industry for offshore supply vessels, uh, construction vessels, cable layers, and the like, um, is that risk assessment, those failure mode effect um, plannings going in there. Okay, so that, that's it really with the codes, but when we're looking at the codes, we're sort of looking at, well, what's, what's upcoming? And um, this is just from what I've seen, what I've been talking to clients about, uh, either owners, operators, is owners are generally we're seeing a, a lot more yachts being built now as explorer type vessels um, some of them just for looks but as they want to go into the arctic the antarctic the designers are going to have to look at ice classing those vessels having the redundancy having the additional stores and um, survivability for those type of regions compared to cruising around st Barts or monaco um, philanthropic, there are quite a few owners now, if there's a, a typhoon or a major devastation in an area, they want to have a boat that's got water making capabilities, medical equipment on board and um, get involved with that. So there's maybe benefit in some yacht designs to add capacity for potential disaster relief programs that owners might want to be seen to be attached to. and. Um, that's something that we, we've talked to several owners about and uh, they were quite excited whether it's as a modular package that's, uh, that they can put on the yacht for those kind of operations and not disturb the, the general running around the island sitting on the beach type cruising. Um, scientific research, uh, there's a lot of owners now who give their boat over to scientific research whether it's oceanographic research, um, finding sunken shipwrecks uh, from old uh, deep ocean exploration there's that's something as well which which requires a lot more things like lifting gear um, deep sea uh, diving equipment nitrogen mixes with the diving setups some of the some of the diving equipment is um, covered a little bit in in the codes as well so some something to look at coming up is uh, how can we make these these vessels more versatile without really disrupting the, the key objective, which is for pleasure? And um, again, I think I mentioned it already. Uh, Bradley mentioned that there's some of the some of the students from Web were doing a project on zero emissions yachts. Um, one of my guys in the New Orleans office recently gave a snamey presentation on design of a zero emissions yacht and the potential technologies 
and we were talking to some clients about that, which was which was useful, a useful discussion. So I've got a few slides in here from his presentation, just as a bit of food for thought. Um, I won't go into it in detail, but this is um, from his, so talking about hydrogen fuel vessels, um, fuel cell technology vessels, and generally generating that hydrogen and uh, electricity on board uh, through then a DC grid system, either generating that uh, plugged, it, plugged into a grid ashore and or um, or through a hydrogen depot there he's got. And he, he was thinking this uh, like a DC grid. Um, so we're talking fuel cells and again, it's not that easy to see here and there's a lot more detailed slides in the full presentation, but generally using that DC grid for propulsors like azipods or uh, the various thrusters and then uh, DCAC converters to hotel loads and um, various normal, the normal 440 AC systems that we would see on a, on a ship. Some of his uh, comments there on the DC grid benefits. Um, again, I'll say if anyone wants a copy of that, shoot me an email and I'll be happy to send it over. Um, but certainly it, it looks like the way forward for some of these, um, certainly the, the lower emission vessels. Now, in terms of power generation, he was talking about um, these hyd hydrogen fuel cells on board. Uh, potentially combining technologies. Um, I was at a SNAMI presentation years ago where we talked about wind kites and sky sail and taking a wine ship from Napa Valley down. I can't remember who gave the presentation now, but it was, I like the idea of taking wind around by kite as long as I could drink it at the end. But that was, um, so, and then so, some of these uh, yeah, wind turbines on board, retractable wind turbines. So and all, using all this to, to generate the hydrogen power to then go into the uh, fuel cells and DC grid. That was some of the comparison of the, uh, the energy density basically of, of the fuel cells versus um, things like, M MTU is generally the engine provider of choice in the super yacht market, uh, along with Caterpillar. Um, the yellow cats that you see on the tugs down in the harbor here, they spray paint them white and uh, thick chrome exhaust chrome rocker covers on and they're off to go on it as a yacht engine but M MTU is generally one of the main um, medium speed to high speed engines that are used in the super yacht market so that's why that <coughs> comparison is there. Uh, he also found these guys who make a fake teak deck which you'd obviously see on a lot of yachts that is actually a solar panel and um, could also be used for a uh, some passive generation of power there while the vessel's sitting sitting alongside, al along with other things like wave capture um, technology. Let's say a lot, a lot of that is in this other presentation. So, of course, when when I'm getting back to the regulatory stuff, hydrogen as a marine fuel, there's been a lot of discussion about that. Short sea ferries, um, there are a lot of benefits to it, but there's a lot of risk mitigation re required as well there. So. When I was talking to Ed, who was putting this presentation together, I was like, yeah, you've got all the pros in there. What about the cons? So he actually did come up with a list there. And um, I think it's, it's useful to see that currently we don't really have the infrastructure for large amounts of hydrogen for, um, it seems like super yachts would be a great market for it because they stay fairly local a lot of the time. They spend a lot of time in port. Um, and then occasionally they will be doing a, uh, a long sea voyage, but the smaller super yachts will be on a dockwise transport going from the Caribbean to Europe. They're not going under their own power. So there is there is good potential there, but the safety concerns and the storage concerns is, uh, is something to bear in mind. And potentially with new regulations as generally being reactive, as owners will be asking maybe for this type of technology, regulators are going to have to uh, come up with some ways to, to get this into those super yacht codes. Okay, and I think that's about it for me. So uh, that was Sailing Yacht A, which was a German build, but maybe to some people's taste, not mine. But <coughs> it's about a 120 meter long uh, sailing yacht. I think it's still probably the biggest sailing yacht around, but quite a beast. Okay, uh, oh, just a 
a couple of things. So Peter Southgate, he's a maritime authority of Cayman Islands. He helped me out with the uh, the Red Yacht Code changes there, or the Red Ensign Group Yacht Code changes. He's heavily involved with that. And um, Ed in our New Orleans office, who was uh, put together a paper for SNAMI on the zero emissions and um, research behind that one. Okay, well, that's it for me. Any questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, go ahead, John. On the, uh, related to developing requirements on the size of the vessel in terms of length, of length and the number of passengers, uh, i give an example. I was involved in the design of a cruise ship for the Hawaiian Islands. And it, it was 2,500 passengers. So it was a big ship above all these requirements. It was permitted to have 50% lifeboats on each side of the rest by life rest because not on an international voyage. And yet, if it did make an international voyage with a reduced number of persons on board, it would still qualify for that. Here, and as I look at these yachts, even though some of them are very large, I'm wondering, they're not so large if you get into a very bad sea condition. And I don't know how many of these owners actually have their whole crew and all the passengers going from internationally. So is, is that a consideration? Or would something like that be for this where you might, it might be able to take 50 passengers, but you only worry about that when you're very close to shore and so you can reduce the requirements. Yeah, so, so the question being really, if, if we're different types of voyages, can we sort of, sub, we can reduce the regulatory requirement if we're not going offshore. There, there are certainly regulations there if you are only doing short sea routes that can be taken into account in terms of offshore survivability and um, as well as that with things like life-saving appliances so if if the yacht is not going to be cruising at all in cold waters if it's spending all of its time in the caribbean islands there's not not a requirement for the, sh the yacht to carry um, survival suits for instance so there's definitely the flag states will consider all of that and uh my experience managing super yachts was that the owners rarely wanted to do a long ocean passage. It was, I think it was very few owners, they generally want to go somewhere, sail short, see a few hours somewhere to, to an next port and um, get off and have dinner again. But there, of course there, there might be chances where there are more on board, but generally they're, they're having a party at anchor, there might be a lot more people on there than capacity for survival craft. Um, you pull up to Chelsea Piers on a sunny afternoon in the summertime, you'll see a 40, 50 meter yacht up there with 100 people stood on the deck and you think, how could they possibly all be part of that? But, but they're tied up alongside or they're just going out in the Hudson River for a, uh, a tool around them and back in again. So yeah, I think in answer to the question, the, the flag states generally, my experience have been accommodating to common sense approaches and putting that in the vessel certification that if you're going offshore by a certain distance that you would be required to reduce manning or take other concerns. But they, they are, most of these yachts are built to a class standard in terms of structural strength and um, class rules in that respect. So whether that's yacht, yacht or special service craft rules, uh, the flag state is going to want to assure themselves that it's built to a standard and strong enough to withstand the normal operating conditions of the vessel. Any other questions? Two, oh. two quick ones. One, how does Marshall Islands get around U.S. flag considerations if they're a protector? And the other one is you talked about the uh, exploration yachts. I saw it at a conference probably five or six years ago. Ninety percent of the vessels that are designed to go into the Arctic regions go once and never go back. Okay, uh, Marshall Islands, I don't know if anyone here from Marshall Islands or international registries? Not tonight. Okay, I, I can't answer anything on their behalf. Um, I, I would say that much like in um, the UK, we have the United Kingdom flag. We also have Gibraltar, which is not the same sovereign nation. So they have their own, uh, they have their own rules and regulations that they're they're entitled to apply. Um, so, so that one I'll, I'll, I would prefer to leave to a, someone who works for a flag state and might be able to explain that better, but I, I would think the Marshall Islands doesn't necessarily have the same requirements as Jones Act. 
ships would, otherwise there wouldn't be so many Marshall Islands ships out there. Um, with regard to the second question of going up to the Arctic and back, I, I guess uh, it looks good on paper when you get there and it gets chilly. Maybe, uh, maybe that's why people don't go back. But, uh, but you know, you, I, I worked for Princess for years, and we would be up in um, going up doing the Alaska cruises. But yeah, generally that would be May till September, and then I don't think there was much market for general public cruisers going to the. Uh, going to Alaska in uh, December or January. So, I don't know, it maybe yeah, may sounds good and then they come back, but, but I think owners like, generally, owners I've spoken to, family office managers I've spoken to, when you're proposing something, much like anything, you know, you buy a set of golf clubs thinking you're gonna go play golf and then it sits in the basement for two years. Um, you might build it for that and never actually go, but it's that, giving people that belief, that dream that, yeah, if we want to do it, we've got the capability to do it. And that, that can increase sales value, increases the marketability of the product, and, and from there. So does that sort of answer the question? Sure. Okay.